It's my honor and pleasure to introduce Juan Herreros to SciArc. Um, to me, it's, uh, it's one of those kind of uh, interesting and sort of problematic introductions. Juan probably doesn't remember this, but I met him in Barcelona in 96 when I was living there. And he came to lecture to the Architecture Society, and then we ended up going out for a party. And uh, that was a time that I know that even though Juan, at that, at that time, his partner, Iñaki Avalos, who they done amazing work in the last 25 years, uh, that was I knew that even though Moneo was an influence on them at the architecture level, certainly was not in their social life. Um, because one of the things I appreciate about the work of Juan and his architecture and his attitude to what architecture should be is the idea of architecture, it has to be an act of joy and it has to stimulate optimism and it has to inspire us to do better uh, societies and cities and so on. So to me, it always has been interesting to look at the work of somebody who lived in Barcelona and it was involved from the Barcelona point of view of ar architecture in Spain. Uh, in the 90s, there was a huge dichotomy between the Madrid school and the Barcelona school. And in a way, I would say as much as the Barcelona was an interesting school, it has a kind of introspective attitude. And the Madrid school at that time, I would say, was a little bit stiff and, and interesting and exciting until Juan, uh, Juan and his team brought a whole different sense about uh, how the Spanish architecture can be a much more aggressive agent in terms of how architecture was shaping globally and changing and so on. So um, over the years, his work has been remarkable as a professional field, but also in the academic field. Um, Juan has been teaching for many years in school in Madrid and also in Colombia, who is right now is a professor in practice there. So his work is one of those very interesting, as I said, in the crossover of the speculation and also what it can be possible and how it can be done. And both of them, and I want to go back to this idea of joy and optimism, they always operate under that frame, which again, it may be not such a, it, it maybe it's not such an, let's say, academic or intellectual world. For me, it's a critical one, especially coming from the heaviness of, I would say, the frame of modernism that dictate the Spanish architecture for the last 50 years, in which very few architects managed to break out from that. And I would say Juan is certainly one of them. So hopefully his lecture will bring you guys joy and will inspire you to aspire to be better architects and also to don't accept the rules of any status quo in which any cultural content that you operate in. So with nothing else to say, I'll give it you Juan Herreros. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Hernán, for this presentation. I think it's, it's, it's not easy to find uh, people who have the, this clarity in the reading of what happened in, in Spain in the 80s and the 70s. Um, how all the architecture of, of my generation is coming from this incredible optimism uh, that came after the disappearance of the fascist uh, government and the uh, option of, of building a, a new country which was in interpreted by every generation in a dif different way. And we were at the school at that time. I, I, I entered the School of Architecture exactly the month that uh, Franco died. So this was a fantastic month. And I think uh, all, all, all my career and all the first 20 years of uh, working have been marked for this uh, situation. And, and now I think uh, we, we, we are in a different situation, a different position, but all the, all the work done, uh, researching, teaching, and, and working to recodify all the heritage of our masters and, and, and recodify the, the role of the architect in the reconstruction of a country, or the super important question about how can we participate in the, in the development of the, of the world around us uh, has been always present. No? Uh, that's because, uh, because perhaps 
Well, that's perhaps because um, I have always talked about the idea of blurring differences between pedagogical practice, research, and, and professional. I think in, in my case they are quite similar and they are continuously changing and, and jumping from, from one to other. I, I can say that uh, I wouldn't be the teacher that I am if I were not the kind of architect and vice versa. And especially because the figure of the project like uh, research. No? I'm not very fascinated with all this idea of laboratories and, and scientific uh, uh, narrative or, or metaphorical approach to, to scientific uh, world or fascination of uh, architects uh, towards this kind of uh, processes. But I really think that uh, working as, as, as an architect means really to establish the rules and the protocols of a permanent research and every work uh, every project, every competition is part of this body of work that uh, now I'm going to call scientific, but because this idea that I, I, I like very much of the scientific community, like the world where the work of one person um, can be continued by other. No? Uh, I think literally, in, in, from Greek language, scientific means useful for others. No? It's the work that you do and you can communicate to the people in your own uh, intellectual world and with that uh, material that you are communicating, other people can do different things. And, and that's because also uh, we work under this umbrella of other concepts, the concept that we call the project of the project. Every time we start a work, first we do is to discuss uh, which is the importance of this work in our panorama, uh, how are we going to do it, who are, going, are we going to call, uh, which uh, programs are going to activate. So this design of the process is an important uh, element and lets us to do uh, apparently different projects or projects which are not very similar but they really share uh, common roots and, and common objectives and they can work in the three levels. They can work at the level of the responsibility, direct responsibility with a client, but they also work in the responsibility of being part of uh, that body of work I was mentioned before. And third, uh, to, to, to make part of something bigger, this, this conversation that all we have as an architectural community. No? And that's because this lecture is, is, is called Dialogue Architecture, uh, just to transmit the idea that uh, dialogue, conversation, communication, as you want, are perhaps the most important tools of architects today, uh, more than the idea of the uh, dramatic isolation or creative processes in the solitude of the office. Uh, I think the architect is more and more one person in the middle of the storm, uh, trying to, um, to take all the dispersed energy and, and, and do something uh, with it. No? So this idea of um, how participate, um, how participate in all the processes, sometimes or most of the times we say instead of crying, instead of consider that the system is not considering us or calling us, that's I, th I think the optimism that Hernando was mentioned before is quite related to with this idea of never complain you know, uh, after fighting you know, all you can. Um, but uh, very especially uh, with the idea of uh, sharing and, and, and changing information with other people uh, with different specialties, with different uh, interests, uh, architecture is usually in, is in, in the middle of the conflict and, and, and is the, the conflict is uh, itself a kind of energy. We could say that the three raw materials that are building the city are change, energy and information. Uh, the change is really the essential part of, of our contemporary world. Energy is absolutely which made possible this change. And information is the more complicated uh, raw material, but perhaps also the most evident and the most important to 
to be able of, of manage and incorporate it to our, to our work because we produce, we consume and we produce information doing architecture and in the way this information really works in the society, uh, we will find a better and more important place. So this optimism is quite related to the idea of uh, utopia, not in the typical sense that uh, utopia like something which cannot happen, but uh, in the sense of uh, place, places that doesn't exist. No? Uh, and, and, and we as architects have the responsibility of building them. We, we have, we, we do projects, which means projection into the future, something that we, we do. Um, I want to show a few projects. Um, three of these projects are very are small projects, uh, and they, they work as uh, dialogue instruments with different worlds. This is also a part uh, in, in a particularity of our office. We have very small projects and big projects. And we, we use the small projects like the laboratory of experimentation of the uh, architectural decisions that we are implementing in the big projects. So all of them are working at the same time. So perhaps uh, if somebody asks us to do something very small, uh, we will say yes, and, and we will test uh, in this small project the facade of the big one. No? Or we will test uh, some concepts or some ideas in this idea of something which happened uh, fast and in a few months is built and is finished. This is one of these cases. Uh, this is a very small uh, square in a corner in the, in the crossing of two very important streets in the city of Wanyu in South Korea, um, where we were asked to do <coughs> a, an intervention in that uh, a strangely shaped uh, corner with a few uh, sad trees and a completely banal and, and intransigent uh, urbanization. No? Um, we did uh, a very fast uh, study about what we had there. This was one of the places where the democracy of uh, South Korea uh, started. Uh, all the the big demonstrations in, in, in Wanyu is supposedly the beginning of this movement that finally got the, the democracy for the country and was starting in this corner in a, in a, books, in a bookshop like, some, like in other places, a bookshop that doesn't exist anymore. So we thought that the place had hidden all these roots. So we, we are not very interested in reveal again then, but uh, we wanted to, to create here a place which could be understood like, uh, like the home of all the citizens, no? like uh, this idea of democracy, like the, 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 the big home. No? Um, so this is just a work about the trees we had and the materials that we, we could understand that we already were there before doing anything. No? So to project something in this, in this place should be like complete or finish something which was started um, and perhaps the time had stopped it. No? We took a few references like this, this drawing of the ideal home by, by, by Loyer in the 18th century. First time that architecture uh, enunciates um, uh, the idea that architecture is not only protection, it's not only refugee, it's not only the division between, between the interior and the exterior, the exterior aggressive and dangerous, and the interior you know, like uh, domestic and, and, and controlled, and perhaps also repressive. Um, Loyer introduces this idea of the uh, primitive um, uh, hood, like uh, expression of uh, sensibility, like a dialogue with the nature and with the phenomenological elements. No? Uh, 200 years after, Rainer Van Ham in here in, in, in LA wrote the text, The Home is Not a House, uh, saying that um, all the technological elements uh, of the domestic life were enough to constitute a house and, and, and putting this uh, accent in the idea that why we build houses to put inside uh, all these technological uh, ingredients of our day life, 
uh, finally, what Baham uh, was concluding is all the piping, the electrical supplies, the air conditioner, the heating system, etc. That's the home, and what we do, the envelope is the house. No, that's the title. A home is not a house. This is a, a house of the colonos in, in Patagonia, in Argentina, uh, destroyed in a fire, and the only sub surviving is the floor, the stone floor, stone to be ther thermical, thermal, thermal floor, and the, and the chimney, you know? So the installations, let's say, the energy part of the, of the house is the only remaining. Like Van Ham said, uh, you know, when, when talking that uh, for 300 years in, in, in the States, all the houses were like a floor, a chimney, and a light, House around, no, uh, from Cape Cod to to um, to the Philip Johnson's glass house in, in the north of, of, of New York, no. Um, with those two references, we said, okay, the, the trees are a part of this home that we want to to build in the middle of the city. Uh, we need uh, some energy. We need light. We need heat. Perhaps we need. Uh, Wi-Fi connection. Uh, we could draw something like this, thinking that this line incorporating the trees and and and, uh, and having then uh, incorporating them uh, into the project and suspended from from three uh, columns like floating could be our project. No, so our project could be something like this. It's a lamp. It's uh, it's a heating system. Is, uh, is there in the day and in, in the night. It's transforming this place in a 24 hours um, site where you can really do what you want. The floor is with these concrete bands in different colors. Some of these bands are going up, sorry for going, are going up like a strange urban furniture uh, that is, is depends of you, how you use, if you sit, if you lie, if you use like a conversation uh, place, if you eat or you uh, use your, your computer, this lamp can emit uh, music, you can control with your iPhone, you can send messages. So it's really a home for everybody in the city. It's also a radical position um, to comment this agotated a discussion between the private and the public that uh, apparently, finally, architects, the only who have been uh, able of, of propose is that private is like the domestic domain and public is the rest. No? Uh, and, and the discussion after 20 years is finished. No? So we, we never have uh, thought about the intimacy of the privacy that we can have in, in the public spaces or how public and how uh, repressed by their own system is the domestic space. So this perhaps is a freedom space. It's one of the places where a lot of people will, will feel more privacy than at their homes. And from the day it was open, there are permanently people there using it like an extension of their, of their homes. No? This is the second of these uh, small projects I want to show. This is mm, related to a kind of dialogue between, between, cons be between environment, we say, or, or about environment. I don't want to say nature, but at the same time, I, I would like to say, no, because this is like a mm, introduction of the natural elements in architecture, but without using uh, organic ones. No? Uh, this is perhaps also a funny critique to this uh, concept that uh, natural uh, architecture is, is becoming like the literal transportation of the green world into the artificial uh, tradition. So I think we can be natural and we can create natural environments only through artificial uh, tools and, and resources. 
Um, but this is an, an interesting commission. I, I'm sorry that I don't have the original building. The original building is, is terribly banal. It's not bad architecture, it's just nothing. Uh, it's good that I don't have because uh, it uh, never could dream to be shown in Sayark. No? Uh, so all, all we have is the final, uh, the final edition. But this is a, a, an interesting commission. A, co a company uh, ha has a headquarters for like offices in the center of the city, and they have um, headquarters for computers out of the city. These places that usually are uh, hidden, uh, super security places, and with some people working there for years, that it's like they, 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 they create their own world in these uh, separate uh, sites. No? This building uh, was completely out of, of any functionality because a collection of permanent small changes had collapsed the building. But at the same time, uh, it was not possible to build a new, a new one. It's only 2,000 square meters, so it could be done perfectly but not because uh, it was impossible to move the computers. So these computers are like prisoners in this building. Uh, was the idea of disconnect them was impossible because these computers manage all the artificial satellites of Spain, from the army to the TV, no? or the cell phones. No? So uh, this company asked us like three questions. No? One was to change absolutely the interior of the building to get a functional office with the idea that uh, a contemporary uh, office, a contemporary space, could really change the spirit of the community of people working there and break this uh, systematic uh, interior, interiorizing of this place, which was like conquest by the, these people who really uh, were doing there like if they were at home. You know? It's these places that because you are in the middle of nowhere, uh, finally you go in pyjama to work. No? Uh, the second was that um, in the development of the times, this, this building needed some sustainable criteria and, and strong uh, security systems that uh, were not uh, having at that time. And third was to get for this building a certain um, presence. Even nobody go here, even um, it's really complicated to get a permission. Uh, um, they really wanted to, to express, to, to, to have something to show, because in this place, something very, very important is happening. And all the strength of this company, who is in the trademark and, and cost millions, uh, is the powerful of this um, control center they have uh, in the periphery of Madrid. So uh, they wanted to, to make a visible building where, where nobody go. No? So, Taking all these elements, the, we, we did, uh, of course, the complete refurbishing of the building. We destroyed uh, all the interiors and the facades, and we kept these people in the, with the computers in a kind of internal igloo inside the building during a few months, and, and we rebuilt uh, the building. The interiors is just like a lot of offices that you already know, but what is interesting is this, this facade that we did like a new envelope. This new envelope, which uh, is, is produced, or is having these two sides, no? the interior and the outside. Uh, the interior one, completely simple, banal, hermetic, and the outside is, uh, you have some corridors to maintain, like escape corridors uh, to control the, the building. And the uh, outside uh, facade, which is a permeable aluminum um, uh, plate uh, with different densities of holes, different colors also, uh, which are not allowing from the outside understand where or what's happening inside. At the same time, they are protecting of the sun uh, because this is originally a circular building. No? So all, every time a part of the building is completely demolished by the, by the sun and by the Spanish uh, heat. No? And uh, it's also this scheme producing the, the image and that, that communication uh, instrument that we were, we were asked to do. So this is the fabrication of this piece. Uh, I said this, uh, there are different colors. Basically, the colors are different, but they are, they are very similar. So it depends of the sun 
the building reacts in a very different way and you think that the sun is operating in different uh, ways in, uh, over the surface instead of make the conclusion that there are different colors. No? The, the density is, is, is of course uh, marked by north, south, east and west uh, orientation. No? This is the north one, very light. This is the east, no? more dense. This is the west. This is the moment in which the, the money was finished and we, we had no more money for aluminium and, and my, <laughs> but you, you, your children always have some friends doing uh, stencils in the, in the street. So for one day they did a legal stencil in, in this building. Here is it. So the question is, and this is perhaps the most important, um, how um, in one moment, the, the work we do um, can really be understood like a communication instrument. Uh, so in this dialogue or in this introduction of the phenomenological ingredients of the natural environment into the artificial with questions like lighting, reflecting, ventilating, etc., but also <coughs> with a geometrical pattern easy to recognize and easy to remember and, and, and with the capability of giving to this small building a strong personality, which now is really the image of this company more than the headquarters that they have in the center of Madrid, which are in a small skyscraper occupying four or five floors of this building. So it's giving nothing to the company as a value. And this is one of the first time that, that uh, um, one of our buildings has has constituted clearly an added value for a, for a client in terms not only uh, ar architectonic, but, but also in terms of uh, image, presence, and, 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 and communication. And, and, and even this company never thought that they, they could give uh, this, uh, they, they could trust in, in architecture like an instrument uh, such a powerful, no? In, in, in terms of uh, solving more than functional problems or, or a simple question of, uh, um, uh, I would say, image in terms of uh, quality, no? But uh, here is more than the quality, it's more than, than having an expensive building or a beautiful office, no? It's really um, the, the proud of being in, in contact with the creative world, of the, the, the proud of, of uh, form part of the contemporary aesthetics. So uh, perhaps the, some people of this company are now more, uh, more convinced no? that it's interesting to, to make part of the present and to make part of, of, the, of the cultural coordinates in, in, in terms of uh, aesthetics or sensibility or Okay, this is the third. This is the third of these uh, small buildings, and the last of this first series. Um, in this case, um, the, the dialogue is, is, is perhaps with the urban culture. No? This is a site where uh, an interesting couple of friends um, asked us to do a small house. No? The site, I, I, I wanted to show you because the, the place is so uh, intense and, 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 and extremely beautiful that um, apparently we, we, we could be in one of these cases of escaping the city. No? So um, the city like the ugly, a place full of tension, uh, working uh, site, uh, noisy, uncomfortable, and the weekend in the nature, like the opposite, no? like the, the good guy of the story, and the nice place. No? So this couple was uh, expressing very clearly that they didn't want to have that. They didn't want to, to express this, this 
opposition between uh, the urban and, and, and the nature and the natural uh, that they really wanted to inhabit the the urban environment they were completely urban people and the, the most advanced expression of their urbanity is precisely to build this house in the middle of the country and use this house like uh, if it were a part of, of Madrid. No? What they said, or they, they say, is that uh, only with the mentality of, of one person uh, living in a strong city like Madrid, you can really uh, appreciate this, this situation. Because if, if, if this situation is not produced by the urban culture, it's stupid. No? The idea of going to the nature to spend the weekends is really um, absurd. No? It's, it's like absurd, uh, like being, uh, I don't know, uh, agricultural vegetarian or, or living in, in the desert and invent the nudist no? uh, culture. No? So if you are alone, uh, it doesn't make sense. No? Uh, so only the city can really produce some sensibilities and, and this sensibility towards the body, towards the nature, and, and, and towards the idea of solitude or silent is, is basically uh, produced by, by one place where you want to, to go and come back permanently. You know? and, and this is <coughs> why this house is uh, very small, um, we could say also uncomfortable, uh, and has only one big room in the, in the first floor with a big terrace, much bigger than the, than the house. And the house is not touching the landscape, it's not touching those stones that you have seen before. It's really supported by some uh, uh, steel columns and it's industrialized. So at the same time that we have this uh, machine there cleaning the stones and, and waiting for the months of the winter and the rain uh, finishing the work of, 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 of preparing the, the site to install these columns, we were actually going to a workshop every week to visit the, the house under construction in this uh, hangar, where um, with technological uh, systems, the, the house was being built and, and, and getting a kind of domestic quality where we are quite close to that idea of, uh, um, of the first project of the Korean, uh, the printing, the printing in, in Korea. And with this, all this simple technology, reducing materials, reducing um, variables, and, and taking these houses, this image was the moment where this, these guys are going to put the portions of the house to to wrap and to put on the tracks and to get the place. This is one of the problems you have, you can have, is that you are completely proud of your industrialized uh, home, and the home, the, the car, the, the track, the stops in a park, in a parking, in the highway, and there are other tracks transporting these incredible pieces. That, that's really technological and not not us. No? <laughs> so these are our tracks. And the house was built in, in, in one day. I think I have here a testimony of this. There is no sound. So we have here this, this place and, and this uh, construction, which is not, is not touching the, the floor, is not touching the ground. Also, there is here a comment about this aggressive um, attitude that sometimes we take uh, preparing the sites. No, this uh, this this problem that uh, to start any construction we have to 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 do a lot of pain to the ground to put some walls, concrete uh, holes. Uh, this is very beautiful because this is the moment of the siesta. Now you are going to see. Okay. <laughs> So now nobody's moving for 10 seconds. And, and uh, it's a um, short manifesto, to a sort of manifesto. This, this house not touching the, the floor, of, of course, is, is, is coming from the history of a lot of examples in architecture. No? But it's good to, to remember no? that not always is necessary to, to get the places and, 
and destroy the, the, the ground before doing anything, no? So, um, well, I'm not going to put this. It's the same, but from inside. Okay, so <coughs> this um, dialogue of the city with the nature, the domest domesticity with uh, this other place, with a complete, completely different uh, concept of comfort and, 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 and creation of a place to work. The, the, the owners of this house used to go, not in weekends, but in, in, in every weekday. And basically what they do there is to, to walk and, and, to, and to work. No? And yeah, you, have, you can see the, the terrace. And also this um, dialogue with the, with the nature uh, through not implementing any mimetical um, gesture in materials, in shapes, in scale. No? So it's the contrast of this house with the environment which really reveals the beauty and also the posture. The house is really put there and, and, and with its position and its attitude is, is showing, the, you know, is, is, is marking where you have to look at, where is the beauty, uh, the beautiful landscape, no? The interior is very, very simple. These uh, recycled um, materials, they are, most of them are recycled for the installation of the uh, ARCO, the Contemporary Art Fair in Madrid. Um, I designed the installation of that fair that year, and and these these fairs are terrible. No, the day they are uh, demolished, all the fur go to the landfill. No, so we we took all these wooden panels and a lot of materials to use to build his house. On the other hand, there are the there are, I want to show you two projects. I want to check the time. I want to show you two projects um, expressing. Um, a conversation with with situations more complicated and more delicate uh, projects that have helped us to understand the, the, the importance of being ready to 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 dialogue and, 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 and to, to to participate in other kind of discussions which are not are not only architectural. This is Norway, it's Oslo. This building is the future uh, Edvard Munch Museum. It's a competition that we won in 2009, or the end of 2009. So um, we have been for, for nearly two years developing the project. The, the building has not started the construction uh, because the process of the, of the project has been more related to the discussions with every a social group, every uh, cultural agent or every sector of the cultural intelligence of the city. And we, we, we have had a, a permanent presence, no? like divided in, in two, two completely different moments every day, you know? like technical meetings in a group of more than 40 people. Uh, developing the project with all kind of experts that you can imagine, and in the other hand, permanent meetings with all these communication uh, situations with, with, with people, with the press, with the media, with politicians, with uh, social forces, um, like if they were completely separate worlds. This is uh, really heavy, I tell you, uh, because um, the discussions are not always uh, based on, on what we as architects consider uh, a kind of logic. No? So you have to understand all the other logics and you have to go uh, into uh, completely different systems. I don't know what's going to happen finally, but um, I, I, I think I, I have changed completely. My, my vehement attitude, like Latin architect, <laughs> trying to convince everybody about everything uh, after this project, uh, where uh, every, any effort to convince the others was uh, received in a very uh, resistant way. The, the museum basically is, is, is what you see. It's a, it's a tall building. 
Uh, not very tall, it's nearly 60 meters. No? Uh, but this is showing this, this podium, which is a vestibule, and, and this uh, west uh, facade, which is working like a <coughs> vertical plaza. Um, and on top, you have a kind of uh, observatory point of the city. The idea is this building is quite close to the Opera House by Esnojeta. Uh, they created this public space in the roof of the building. So uh, as a continuation of that public space, we are creating this new public vertical space in the facade of the building. It's what we call the, the dynamic museum and the static museum. The dynamic museum is this collection of platforms, staircases, meeting points, uh, etc., which are used like a connection system of the, of the building. No? And the static museum is a, is a collection of floors, a stocket of rooms, offices, the restoration department, etc. Uh, this means that uh, you have to enter the floors or every room and, and, and leave before going to the next. So this is not a museum that you go from one room to other room in the classic uh, system. Uh, for certain reasons, this is very important for these people. For example, you can close rooms and, and the scheme of the museum is not suffering. Uh, or when, when you close these rooms in the night, they are like security boxes. You know that Munch is one of the most, uh, is perhaps the most stolen artists in the world. No? The, the, every museum with moon paintings is, is uh, violented every year no? with, by fanatics of, of uh, his work. Um, but also, um, is, is, is behind this idea of uh, expressing the concept of, uh, of the um, public space or the public infrastructure of the museum like a part of the city, a part of the city that is working like streets or small plazas. And it's starting in this indoor plaza, which is the lobby. Of course, the weather conditions in, in Oslo are really demanding these public indoor spaces. So you can, you can be here. You, 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 don't, uh, you really enter the museum when you pass across this glass wall. Uh, so here is a good place to do an appointment or to have a coffee or to buy a present to a friend, uh, like if you were in, the, in, in, in an open air space. No? This is, and the, the opera has something similar, the future Deichmann Library built in front also will, will have something like, like this. No? So this is, a, we could say, a public system of going into the building and going up and, and have this, this terrace on top. No? This is, this is not the, the terrace on top, this is the Diana lobby where you have this coffee shop and you can see the bay because this building is inserted in all this uh, huge project that Oslo has in mind of transform the whole city in a fjord city, you know, having all these big buildings in the, in the shore. These are the typical floors with the dynamic part and the, the static part dividing, divided in always in two rooms, one big and one small. Sometimes these rooms are the offices or are the restoration department. So perhaps the Munch Museum is going to be the first museum where the visitors going up in the escalators are going to see the people working, are going to see the restoration department, something important, for example, for children to understand how intense is the work behind these silent rooms where you see these innocent paintings hanged on the walls. No? Uh, and, 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 and it's important that the, the, the people really understand that the museum is not only this storage or taking care of the uh, old paintings. It's like a very, very active place with, with uh, a lot of activities uh, from public activities like pedagogical or seminars or whatever, but, but also research and, and, and lending and organizing exhibitions and the restoration department. One of the big discussions at, at the level of national government has been the size of the restoration department of this museum. Because if you, every 50 square meters bigger you do the restoration department, you reduce 10 years, the time you need to restore all the collection of, of Munch. No? So this is, has been really uh, complicated. So it's quite important that the people can really see, not visit, but see behind the windows all these people working. This is one of the um, contemporary uh, current stages of the, of the museum. Uh, a lot of these 
facilities asked by the technical departments uh, oblige us to inhabit places uh, of the building where was not uh, previewed in the in the in the competition project. No, so finally we, we had to to create uh, a lot of uh, spaces inside the structure uh, and make them uh, inhabitable. No, to to place all these new. Uh, facilities that every day the, the, the clients were asking us. No? This is the top terrace. And that's also um, this um, decision of inside we have this dynamic and static, different floors with different heights, with different activities. No? But from the outside we really wanted to have this enigmatic presence of something that you don't understand very well how to work, how work, how works, but you identify some movements of people or, or escalators or different lights because there are different rooms behind. And, and, and to do that, uh, we invented this undulated glass facade with different transparencies and with different densities that could really play with the stimulation of the of the sun, no. Uh, Norway is not exactly a very sunny place, uh, but uh, it's a very lighty, no. So you have uh, the, the the clouds are continuously moving and changing color. So this building could be gray, pink, uh, invisible, uh, white, and yellow, depending of the moment, depending of the day, no. So we 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 did all this. Um, exercises and, 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 and mock-ups one-to-one to look for the materials that could uh, transform this uh, solid body into something evanescent, no? something more uh, delicate and, and, and ready to change. This is also a, an attitude uh, of the building, no, like uh, like an alive object, no, like uh, not being resistant. Don't try to be always the same and show the same aspect, but to be, you no, know, playing with uh, with the conditions. This is an image just to express all of the huge concerns of the of the competition, no. Uh, the, the, was the they were asking for a holistic holistic uh, environmental concept, so was not just to demonstrate that you were sustainable, uh, you really had to uh, express clearly how energy and, and, and consumption was a part of the design and the design was involved in, in, in this and not necessarily uh, adding protestical uh, elements. No? So this is uh, with the TABS, no? Thermal Active Building System, which puts the concrete to work uh, with uh, hot on, 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 or, or cold water inside and, and, and transported it through the building. So there is not air conditioned, it's a passive house and, and, and the building is con continuously uh, acting like a um, well-tempered uh, object. No? And um, well, this is the, the opera house. And this is, was one of the discussions and this is still today one of the big ones. And, and this is the other, no? the urban presence of the building. We have been defending for these two years that Oslo really needs one public tall building which could be like the postcard of the, of the future uh, and a building that could receive no? the big boats coming uh, with the tourists to, 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 to visit the city. And, and, and we have uh, the population divided between the ones who love this idea of having a prominent building, which is a museum, uh, which is not an office uh, or a hotel, no? and, and others who say that uh, the tradition of, of Norway uh, is not about tall buildings, so precisely public buildings shouldn't be uh, tall buildings. This is not exactly true, because this is, this is the town hall of Oslo. Uh, unfortunately, it costed 35 years to build it because the same discussion. So uh, I don't know if we are starting the same process. <laughs> uh, well, this is um, 
the, the, the competition was also related to, to, uh, to the creation of a neighborhood. I, I'm, I'm not going to show it, but this is um, in, important because it's not an isolated building or an isolated gem in the middle of, 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 of the city. It's really a very prominent uh, site uh, surrounded mm -hmm. by, by a hybrid program of housing, uh, offices, commerce, uh, restaurants. So really we are building like a complete fragment of, of city uh, and, and the museum is, is part of, of it. No? And, and I think this is also uh, important and, and interesting. Perhaps Norway is one of these places where the civil society is really strong and the idea that every building, every public building has the obligation of create some urban environment uh, that can be used by, by everybody and can really realm the civic spirit of, 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 the, of the city is, is quite uh, attractive. No? And well, this is the this last uh, image no? uh, from the the, the side, uh, the east side, where uh, the opposite to the dynamic part uh, is where perhaps the building is more enigmatic and is really competing with these big boats. No, is where you don't know if it's uh, a strange object, object uh, just arrived by the sea or or, or, or a big uh, floating housing ready to go. No. But uh, I was saying, uh, the period of Oslo really show us and, 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 and help us to, to change uh, some of our uh, vehement uh, attitudes as architects. And, and it was uh, absolutely true. And we, we, we had to develop other, other, other tools. No? This is the last project I want to show. This is a competition that we recently won in, in this last summer in Bogota. It's to do a, huge um, convention center, uh, huge not for the states perhaps, uh, nothing is huge for the states, uh, but a really important building for the city of Bogota. Um, I want to start with this image because we could say this is an intermediate space, this is not inside, this is not out outside, uh, it's a kind of gallery where we see people who are attending a, a congress, but also citizens uh, just passing by. Uh, we have this group of students in a great uh, kind of amphitheater going down from where they can see something inside the building. But also from outside, you understand very well how the building works. You see this huge space. Uh, public indoor plaza uh, la, uh, la, as a heritage from the Oslo project. And this is spiral stair going up and explaining you very clearly how this building works and what you have to do if you enter there and, and, and depending of, of where you're going. No? So this um, is the concept of this building that is taking also from the Oslo project, one idea that uh, was very uh, strong in the, in the promotion of, of the project, that was this dynamic part of the, of the museum had the main sense of helping the people going up, visiting the museum, uh, to, to love, to understand and to love the city of Oslo. The, the, the plan was that visitors uh, most of the visitors Oslo, Oslo has are coming in, in these big cruisers. They are a few hours in the city and they go to visit two museums. No? Um, so as you go up one more floor, you have a different view of the city. So you start with the big kings, you go to the medieval city, you go to the 19th industrial city, the, the 20th century, and the contemporary. No? So you, you, you can read, you can reconstruct all these past, present, and future of the city of Oslo. And you can um, really get involved by the uh, relation and contact that the city had with the nature, 
uh, along, the, along the history, and now how the city is really more or less finished because the mountains are there. So from the top, you really understand this relation with the, with the hills around Oslo. Uh, this was behind this, this drawing, very innocent, done at the beginning of this competition, where we said, okay, here the movement is not going to be by the facade, the movement is going to be by the interior, and we will have some moments to, uh, to look outside and to have, again, this um, concept that the visitors of the Congress centers, they, they come from around the world, they live in an ugly, banal hotel in the periphery of the town, and they go every morning to the, to the Congress Center, and, and finally they don't have any relation with the, with the city. No? So um, the spiral is, is transforming the, what usually should be the lobby. Uh, in this case, it's a kind of public space going across the whole building. And the lobby is going to be these small lobbies, which are, will work like the lobbies of different parts of the, of the, of the building which are at the same time um, are observatory points or observatory des de uh, decks uh, towards the four orientations uh, that in Bogota you know, are the cerros, the mountains, the old city, the new city, and the savanna. No? So they are very different landscapes with very different ecologies and with very different perceptions and, and very different beauties, no? So the transformation of this scheme, which starts from the idea of, of putting the exhibition space uh, in the underground, uh, that's because those children were looking inside this place, to put the 4,000 people auditorium on top, because they were the two elements that the program were asking of 4,000 square meters, and having all the intermediate, intermediate uh, size uh, meeting rooms um, to create this spiral, this pile of different blocks going uh, from the ground to the, to the top. So we could say this is all. You know? uh, this is exactly the same drawn with more detail, with some uh, structural decisions, and with, um, for example, with some particular elements like this. This is, uh, again, a non-air-conditioned building. The weather in, in, in Bogota is perfect for this. So the whole building, in this case, is ventilated naturally. So we have this roof, like uh, strong chimneys, creating the depression of the, of the air by the change in the temperature and evacuation the air of the building. These uh, drawings are yeah, just to express how we put the ex expo in the ground floor, uh, per, 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 mm, sorry, in the, uh, under, underneath, but uh, we try always to don't express this idea that this, like in the basement, no, is really connected with the outside. When you are on the top, exactly the same. You can reconstruct the the the, the circulation. That is the stair going to the expo. This is the lobby of the auditorium. The auditorium is on top of this lobby. So we have a kind of urban instrument to increase the communication between different neighborhoods. This is also uh, um, the determinant part of the, of, the, of the program because the competition was, was asking to get from this building a kind of collaboration with the neighborhoods, no? So it's not only having the people inside these visitors temporary for a few days in the city, but create some uh, facilities which were really helping these neighborhoods to, to develop. In the future, uh, Bogota will develop a, a kind of urban center around this building. So this is very particular because the buildings usually are in the periphery, and this is going to be in the very center of the new center of, of Bogota. And, and that's because we are trying to look for this permeability um, across the building. No? There are images to demonstrate how it could be Use and again, if the image before was a scheme, this is this is the architectural drawing, but not not adding nothing new to that. No? What is important is that the four sides of the building have uh, four different uh, landscapes. They are attending four different situations. I'm not going to 
to explain, but we <coughs> did this effort of Im imagining some uh, sense that could help us to transmit the idea of what can you do there, how the space around the building, the building itself finally is a congress center, uh, even if I explain it like a plaza or whatever, but the space around can be really a meeting point of um, visitors and residents or citizens and sporadic uh, uh, tourists. Um, and I don't know if you can read. Yes. Just for, for the people knowing Spanish, all the names we used were like uh, uh, um, the names of a big house, no? Like Garden, Zawan is, I don't know, in English, doesn't exist. Hall, um, Jardín, Patio, uh, no? Plaza. So just to expressing that this is a open space for everybody. You know? And we always were saying the children of the houses in front of the, of the um, Congress Center can be under these trees doing some, some work, uh, homework and, and other uh, Congresses can be there uh, answering their emails. You know? and, Something that would happen, like here, for example. No? So this this uh, understanding of the of the the ground and you know, like a nolly plan of Rome, no, like a connection and continuity of the public space going into the building and creating this point of coincidence for a very very different kind of, of people is a part of the of the program for us, no, and and also it's a part of the program the the, the, the facades, no, again looking for a system that you don't understand exactly what happened, but you, you have elements that you recognize very well what they are. This is, the big auditorium is 4,000 people. Perhaps 4,000 people for a Congress in Bogota never is going to happen. Uh, they only will have 4,000 people for the Sakira concert one day every year. <laughs> uh, and so, we, we propose to divide it in 2,000, which is the maximum size of typical congresses, and the, the rest 2,000 is a flat room there. This flat room can have some retractable grades, so the day that you have Sakira, you can have the 4,000 people, but the, the rest of the, of the days, you have this place divided in, a, in the pure auditorium, and this flat salon, where you can do a lot of things. This is a render that we did to answer a question of the jurors of the competition, when we said, but uh, what can you do in this flat place? You know? And we said, uh, well, you can do a presentation of a car, you can do all these typical stupid things that uh, happen in these places. No? And in one moment we said, okay, the, the, the success of build, build, this building would be the moment in which this is the best place in the city where get married, no? Like, uh, but you can say, uh, I invited you to my mariage. Come to the Congress Center, so, uh, such a place. <laughs> uh, so we, we, we propose uh, the, the Camera of Commerce of the city to change the name of the building, no? Uh, to, to, to you can say that you are going there, no? And if this is the 2000 auditorium people uh, here you see how it could work, like the auditorium and flat, all auditorium, and with other combinations no? in big on or small events. No? This is also to say this is not only a congress center, it's not only a place for having 2,000 guys with Thai discussing about, uh, I don't know. Um, it can be a place for fun, it can be a place for a film festival or for a pop music uh, concentration. You know? So we, we have all these festivals around the world in big surfaces with different scenarios. You can do in a huge building with very diff different uh, scenarios too. We have here rooms from 50 to 4,000 people finally, so it's, uh, it could be important. Or you can do this you know? every Friday, you can have the best uh, 
electronic music disco of South America because you have a good parking, you have a good place, you have an incredible uh, acoustic system. Uh, it's safe, it's, it's fantastic. So this is not only a place for uh, typical congresses, so every person in the city could have a reason to go this place from time to time. No? This is the name we proposed, also because Centro Internacional de Convenciones is uh, no, the name was Centro Internacional de Convenciones de Bogotá, no, like CICB, is Centro Internacional de Convenciones de Bruselas, Centro Internacional de Convenciones de Barcelona. All of them have the same name, and you never know if it's International Center or Centro Inter Centro de Convenciones Internacionales. <laughs> so we we say okay, we have to change this, and we we proposed Agora, like the meeting point, and like the this uh, Greek uh, place to um, to to have all the people together and to to be together in the creation of the of the a strong of a strong society. No? So this is finally a project of dialogue with the city. So all the city is compressed in this building and uh, squares, streets, public spaces, public facilities you know, are all of them stocked and, 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 and pressed in this simple volume. Um, also like an expression uh, through this concept of Agora, uh, of our love and, and interest toward the city, our favorite landscape, uh, and for sure, and, and, and the most, uh, the, the, perhaps the only utopian construction uh, in the history. No? Uh, it's very easy to criticize the city. Uh, it's not so easy to criticize nature, but nature is really bad design, uh, has too many problems, no? uh, more than cities perhaps. And, and, and this is like a kind of tribute to this uh, city construction no? and, 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 and uh, an expression of something and that everybody could understand. Every person, every, every, every kid, Every citizen, every visitor, every person who never was in Bogota can come here and from these lobbies understand the city and, uh, and, and, and feel comfortable because they know how the, the building works and to get any, any of these places, rooms or salons and, and with exactly with the same uh, fun and with the same emotion that you discover walking in a city that you visit by first time in your life and you discover their corners or their hidden or their secrets.
develop this area, like the new center, this is Avenida Las Americas, the connection between the historic center and the airport, it's a huge infrastructural corridor, and it could be the origin of this new development of, of Bogota in the savannah. Okay, that's all for today.